and welcome to Long Story Short. My name is Corey Baker. I am the president and CEO of the Long Center, and we're so excited to have you join us for this series. Uh, since the pandemic started, we've been trying to catch up with Austin artists and all the incredible creativity that continues to go on in our city. Um, despite us being physically apart. And so I've had the opportunity to talk to a lot of wonderful community members and artists and musicians. And so uh, we're thrilled to be doing this series. Today is a members only Q&A. So everybody in here is members of the Long Center. So first and foremost, thank you so much for your support. We would not, literally would not exist without the support of our membership and um, from generous donations from our community. And so we can't thank you enough for sticking with us during these times and are just so excited to uh, continue to progress and, and support the arts in Austin going forward thanks to your membership. So for today, I'm just, I am really excited to be here with uh, Graham Reynolds. I was looking at his bio and, and trying to think about how to introduce you as a composer and, and band leader and innovator. And, and really, when I think of you, I mean, you're just iconically Austin. You, uh, you really are. I know that's a big title, for, <laughs> but uh, having worked with so many organizations and so many artists and just being so integrated in this community, it's just such a thrill to get to work with you through the Long Center and, and so appreciate having you here. Welcome. Thank you for having me. Of um, course. Great, all the work you're doing during all this. It's a hard time to adjust, but you're making it happen. Well, thank you. We appreciate that. And and we are just talking about literally you have been with the Long Center since day one, since before day one. But we were just talking about that uh, Graham actually composed two pieces. He was working with the Austin Symphony uh, in our, our main hall, Dell Hall, and also with the uh, incredible Rudmex uh, Theater Company in, in Rollins on our opening night. So you, you have probably some of the longest history with the Long Center. Uh, you could write a book about everything you've done in, in our campus. <laughs> it's, yeah, I mean, we started getting a tour, tours when it was under construction and then rehearsed with the Rudes in there and then rehearsed with the symphony. And then of course, opening night and having something downstairs and upstairs and then all the work we've done together since. It's been amazing. And for those, I think, you know, I always think, I'm sure most people have, that have been in Austin for any amount of time have encountered your work somewhere or someplace throughout the city. But for those that might be unfamiliar, tell us a little bit about yourself and, and kind of what you've been up to. So I, I do, I, I collaborate a lot and then I compose independently. I do a lot for film and TV, so a lot of screen and scoring. I do a lot with uh, theater and dance with Ballet Austin, with the Rude Max, with Porklips, with a whole bunch of Austin-based theater and dance folks. And then uh, I compose concert music and then lead bands in more improvisational areas. So I've always got something of all of those going on at once. Uh, and I love doing all of it. That's awesome. That's awesome. And we appreciate last week you actually premiered your album, Graham, with a listening party um, for the Long Center. And, and we have it on our YouTube channel for everybody that uh, did not get to tune in. You should really check it out. It is very cool. But um, the album was originally for Ballet Austin's Grim Tales, which is uh, the ballet that was last year premiered at the Long Center. And I got to see it and it was just, I'm just so blown away. I'm sure many of our audience members hopefully got to see it, but it was just, I mean, I, I'm, a, I'm a huge dance fan. And so went in expecting to love it, but was just, I was so thrilled with the atmosphere that you all created. And this, I mean, it's really the darker side of Grimm's Tales. And it was really beautiful the way, not just the choreography itself, but the music and the visual elements um, just were so fully integrated and set such a mood for the audience. And you just felt like you went into this fantasy land, I mean, fully. And so for that project, you work with Stephen Mills, who's the amazing yes. artistic director and choreographer for Ballet Austin, and Natalie Frank, who created these gorgeous, huge visual, visual arts backdrops. Um, 
you know, I'm really curious, how, how do you go in together? What does that process look like? How did you work together to come out with such a fully, you know, it, it felt so holistic, the piece that you yeah. all created. The, you know, for me, with any collaboration and virtually everything I do has some element of collaboration. The first part of the process is figuring out what the process is going to be. Mm -hmm. And instead of going in with preconceived notions of this is the way it works, because you, know, you have three very different artists, Natalie working the visual, uh, Steven as a choreographer and me working with the audio. And if we all came with preconceived notions of this is how we're gonna work together, they don't line up. And so uh, Steven and I have a lot of history and we had the very first uh, project we did together was with Tr Trent Doyle Hancock. So another visual artist, another deep world that Trenton had been working on since he was seven years old. And we were sort of doing a chapter within that. So in this case, we were working with Natalie. And so there was the whole Grimm Brothers world, which everyone uh, is familiar with to a degree. But then Natalie with her super intense style was also, it was a, a feminist uh, reclamation project in a sense where these were uh, mothers and grandmothers' tales that the Grimm brothers collected, and then their names were attached. So she retold them and reclaimed them, and also re resexualized them and made them as grotesque as in political as uh, sexualized as the initial were before they got, you know, uh, more palatable for contemporary tastes. And so we had this deep world to dive in. So that really was the starting point. Everything comes back to those paintings and those stories. And that provided a, a, a centerpiece for Stephen and Natalie and I to all move forward together based around. Amazing. And the music itself, I think, as soon as you were, and it, and I know you've, you've scored movies and it, I, I think we don't realize how much the music is kind of subtle sometimes and, and, you know, not in our faces necessarily, but it really does set a mood. And when I came into the hall and, and seeing you in the pit and hearing the music and, and it really does, you, you went in kind of just set up, you're anxious for, for what then the dancers and the visuals really delivered. So it, it yeah, Thank it's you. really beautiful. And I, I do, suggest everybody go on and, and see the listening party and see what happened. Um, and being that there was such a stretch of time between the actual performances and the album that came out, did a lot change? Did you go back and remix anything? Or even is the, the times that we're in, did that affect at all what the album looks like versus the performances? So, you know, I'm working on a million things at the same time, all the time. And certain things have a deadline, certain things don't. And so the performance, we had, you know, thousands of people coming to see the show and that had to be done. And so, it, uh, so that meant that that work was complete. I also had to do a recording for them to rehearse to. So there was a very, there was a good recording, but not a complete ready for streaming recording. Uh, after we were done, for them to be able to tour in case they couldn't tour with a 25 piece ensemble, we needed to make the recording a bit better so that it matched what they had choreographed to. Mm -hmm. And so we did that and then, but there were still details that I wasn't happy with in terms of their own intonation being off here, the mix not quite being good enough here. It's you know fine for rehearsal, uh, but not fine for this is the permanent version of this audio art and so we dug in we re-recorded some things overdubbed some things but timing all remains the same so that if so that the ballet if they did this again could use these newer recordings if we weren't going to do the live ensemble as far as uh, responding to the moment the the art itself didn't respond because we finished the tracking just before covid mm -hmm. um, uh, but the actual proceeds from the Bandcamp sales of the album are going to Black Lives Matter for uh, until the end of July. It's wonderful that you're able to do that. Well, 
it's a small, it's, it's what we can do. I mean, it's, it's not everything we can do, but with the album, it's what I felt we could do. That's awesome. And people should go to Bandcamp, right? Is the best place yeah. to go to be able to get the album and, and get the most support to you and to the Black Lives Matter. Yeah, thing. and I listen on Spotify and things like that, but if you're looking for the money to get most directly to the artist, uh, Bandcamp is, is the way to do that. And we're passing all those monies on to Black Lives Matter. Um, you can also, if you prefer listening on Spotify or one of the others, you can put the money in through Bandcamp and listen on this, your favorite service. It doesn't, um, but but yeah, that, that's the most direct way that's to great. support. That's great. And I was supposed to remind the audience too, um, I do have a Q&A box of uh, questions from the audience. We are always interested in seeing that and, and we can share and I can ask Graham directly. So if you do have specific questions, you can pop it up. If you go to the bottom of your screen, you'll see the Q&A and um, I'll kind of peek over for them. But you did mention, Graham, that you have uh, always have a lot going on. And I think that's probably an understatement. Um, you seem to, uh, you know, like I said, it's it's cool because I see you pop up in expected places and unexpected places. So I'm curious, um, you know, how, how do you find your projects? What excites you? How do you prioritize what you're doing? And then part two, what do you have coming up that you're really excited about working on? As far as finding projects, it's a balance of things that I come up with myself come up with collaboratively and things that come to me. Film and TV tend to come to me. There, so we had uh, like a, a BBC project we're working on right now that we had started, they had filmed well, well before COVID and we were in the process of wrapping that up. But then other films that had shot before COVID but hadn't finished their post-production or hadn't finished their edit. Now I'm just now getting those projects coming in and starting to work on those. Um, and then th whether it's through Golden Hornet or talking to potential collaborators, uh, I've always got big lists of ideas and I love doing research and I'll do deep dives into a new theme or a concept or a, you know area that I want to reflect on musically. And a lot, a lot of the work comes out of that kind of research project. Coming up, we have MXTX. Um, that's a Golden Hornet project uh, effort, and it's so it's a sample library. It's an album, and eventually a live show as well. Although the live show part, we're going to wait and see how long when that was going to happen. But it's a collaboration between Mexican and Texan composers and DJs. So over fifty artists contributing. And uh, we've got 25 gigabyte, which is a lot of files, of sample library that will be, once the album comes out, that sample library will be open for, for public use anywhere in the world. Anybody can use those drum loops or saxophone samples or whatever that's in there. There are all sorts of things. Um, and so it's sort of merging the DJ electronic producer world and the composer world and matching up together in this cross-border project. Um, we have a silent, I've been doing silent films originally with the Alamo for years and years, and then uh, also with the Paramount the last few years, and uh, this London-based label called Fire Records is putting out an album this fall, and so we've been working at, uh, for the Alfred Hitchcock's silent film called The Lodger. So we, in they're pretty early during COVID, finally finished the mixing and mastering and, and all on, on that. Anyway, I could go on and on with all the projects we're working on, but those are a few of them. That is so cool. Um, yeah, looking forward to that. And again, as a, as a reminder, Q&A box is open. We're getting some things popping up. I think, you know, one of the questions we're getting is, is how do we keep up on you? Um, what's the mm. best way to kind of be able to follow and hear about the projects that you're working on? And uh, for me, uh, I think email is really the best way. I mean, because we try to keep up and we do keep up with Instagram and Facebook and the various platforms. Uh, but those are always changing. Uh, mm. And as we know, and uh, whereas we try not to let anything go by that we don't let the email list know. And 
you know, people change their emails, but the, the general platform of what email is, is not shifting the way that Facebook to Instagram is always changing every few years. That said, um, the Instagram account is pretty active. Uh, maybe Facebook second to that and Twitter following that. But as far as knowing where everything is, uh, email and to a degree my website, although my mom's always getting on me for, you don't have this on your website calendar. So it does sometimes slip through the cracks a little bit. That's hilarious. <laughs> a lot going on. And yeah, you know, I was I was amazed at I mean when everything kind of shut down. I remember leaving the offices on March 13th and you know leading into spring break and kind of looking at my office and being like, what should I grab? And I'm like, eh, how long can it be? You know, famous last words and kind of and walking out and really haven't been back since. And it was amazing to me how many artists just immediately started putting content online and and just having to create and and wanting to find ways to connect with audiences regardless and knowing how much we all need artists and and that kind of connection right now and so it was really inspiring for us at the at the long center and it's part of this platform is we're not you know a producer of art we really are here to lift up the community and amplify uh artists efforts and and try to support them and so we've tried to do that with the platform and draw attention so kind of curious you know what i mean you've been keeping busy obviously but what else is inspiring you and is there anything that you've been tuning into or anything that you're looking forward to post covid that's kind of kept you going through these these apart times uh i think there are things with the elimination of perform, I mean, I've been performing since I was really young, all the time. And so this this break from performing, this break from going to see performances, this break from social engagements of of really any serious kind has opened up all these pockets of time. So even though I'm doing a ton of work, I spend every morning uh, at the beginning of the day just on the back patio, listening to the birds, watching the squirrels go argue with each other and, and reading. And so having this time to, it's, it's to engage with the, the nature in my backyard and, and read and be inspired by those things is really the, I, I read a lot before, but that's the biggest change, being able to really make a daily habit of it in a serious way. Um, and then, I mean, I've been, I always do a lot of, of listening, but, um, uh, hmm. so Liu Qianhua is a Chinese composer I've been listening to a, a lot during this. Uh, Szymanowski is a Polish composer I've been listening to a lot this past several years, but I've gone a little uh, deeper in, and then, um, Oh, Hilder, what's uh, Hilder, the composer who did Chernobyl and did the Joker, uh, Hilder uh, Guanadotir, is that right? And there's two, there's an Icelandic composer whose name is similarly very hard to <laughs> pronounce. Uh, that very well. uh, but the Chernobyl score, I was just listening to that two nights ago. It's just an incredible work. And isolated from the show, it's just a, a deep, uh, world of sounds and and music uh, so that's super inspiring and as soon as i saw the joker i was like that's that's gotta win the oscar it's gotta win everything this year and it fortunately it, it did um so yeah she's amazing and the 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 palette that she uses for these scores is all tied back to the independent work she did as a composer and i believe cellist uh, prior to doing any film. So it's rooted in her personal artistic voice. And that's always encouraging when it's not, you know, not bending to the to the wind of the current, uh, what, what movies think this music's supposed to sound like. Actually, I think everybody's gonna be trying to make scores like her for the next few years. That's amazing. Well, that answers, you've got a question about what's on your playlist. So that's really helpful for us. And, and also people wondering um, how you think, what we can be doing best to support artists during these times. 
I, it's tough. I think people yeah. want to and they really don't know. I mean, going to band camp and downloading is a good start, but what would you like to see the community do to rally? I mean, there, it's, there is so much to support right now and all of it needs it so badly. We're in an election year. We're in the middle of the Black Lives Matter really coming to the forefront of the national consciousness. And we're in the midst of everyone being out of work and performing artists not being able to engage in any work and visual artists not being able to sell their work. It's just total. So I, for me, it's a little bit uh, personal. If you were engaged, who, whoever you were engaged with before, I would try to be still be engaged with. If you were supporting before, I would try to still support. If you would have bought tickets to something that can no longer happen, and if they have a nonprofit way to give, or if they you, they sell albums, or if they sell books, I would support those artists you've been supporting. Then with this new, it shouldn't be new, but with this sort of n n renewed awareness uh, of where we are, I'd also find uh, new artists, uh, artists of color, women artists, uh, black artists that that you weren't aware of before and ask for recommendations. It's, it's both part of the sort of re-education of ourselves, but also diving into a really rich, rich world of art that not everyone knows. I mean, uh, you know, James Baldwin, I mean, it's just an incredible writer. Uh, whether it's a love story or whether it's fire next time, just an incredible crafter of, of words, as well as uh, really laying out this the, the scenario that continues 50 years later, 60 years later, in such a strikingly similar way. Um, so there, you, with, with Baldwin, you get deep art and deep politics all at the same time. So I think those are, those are some of the ways to support. Continually engaging with artists you've been are uh, engaged with in the past and discover these new artists that have not had an equitable chance to be heard or seen or read. That's yeah, yeah. that is some of the positive coming out of what's happening now is exactly. you know, hopefully we'll really see some real change and it feels different and hopefully that will continue. And, and we'll have some resources on the Long Center website too about how to discover new and different artists. And, and I would add to, um, it being involved nationally with colleagues, sometimes I, I forget how lucky we are to be in Austin in a town where people, it's just, it's in our blood. It's, we, we care about what's going on. People here really love being in Austin because of the music and because of the artist and because of just the soul of the city. So I would say um, I've been really proud to see the council and mayor really at least having these conversations that don't happen yeah. in other cities. So um, sending support, saying, letting them know that you care about our artists and, and to continue to try to help venues. I mean, it's heartbreaking to see some of these venues that are, are shutting down. So um, continuing to keep that conversation. And I've, I've actually heard from some of the artists that we talked to is, you know, as you said, you've been, oh, there's my dogs. Uh, you've been performing live and they're missing that live interaction. So I also say, you know, leave comments, send an email or a note to your favorite artist. So they're reminded that you're out there. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, we have a good question too in the Q and A, and then I can kind of mute while Amazon arrives or whatever is happening out there. Um, it says, what silent film would you rescore if there were no limitations? I love it. So, so uh, Tim from the Alamo, we, we were literally just this morning emailing about this um, because Alamo, obviously, they don't have uh, any, any of their theaters functioning at the moment. So they're doing some streaming events and things like that. Um, and since 99 or 2000, that's where I first really started scoring films, was doing silent films for the Alamo, starting with Battleship Potemkin. Uh, so, so Buzz, who's been working with me since bef even before that, has been digging through old recordings to find old the silent films. I did dozens and dozens of them. Some that I spent months scoring, and some of them, there was one where 
Peter Stopchinsky, who is accident prone, like broke something. I don't remember what happened, but he couldn't play the gig. And it was a Harry Ransom Center screening of a Ukrainian Soviet Ofshenko film at the Alamo. And uh, so Peter, but Peter could not physically get there. So they called me in to play. It was a sold out house. And I had never seen the film. I knew nothing about the film. And I, so I improvised, I got, I had it described to me uh, five minutes before, and then I played the whole film and we had that recorded. So we're looking back at these old recordings, but I think going back to Battleship Potemkin, the first real uh, feature that I, full feature that I scored, um, I would re-examine that and see what I still, like from what I did back then and what I would do differently now and and attack and so we had a series of emails with the Alamo this morning about potentially doing that so we'll see cool well we'll, we'll look out for that project that's yeah. awesome <laughs> and then we have another um what was the first show or performance you saw that really inspired you to become an artist do you remember or you're just born with it um as far as <laughs> Uh, as far as it wasn't a performance, it was my mom taking piano lessons. And I thought, oh, I was five. My mom was the coolest. So I want to do what mom's doing. So I asked for piano lessons too. And that's really how I started. That's awesome. As a mom, like yeah. you're, uh, you're giving me all the feels. I'm like, maybe someday my boys will give me a shout out. And <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Well, I know we're already at 30 minutes, and um, so I don't want to forget. We've been asking everybody this, and, and we you know, talked about this earlier. You have so many Long Center memories. Um, would love to just hear one of your favorites. Ooh, it's such a hard question because, uh, because it, uh, I've been doing something in the Long Center every year since you opened. Uh, and so, but so since I started combing through at the beginning, I'm gonna, I was remembering one from the beginning, which was a piece I wrote for the opening. Uh, opening, it was with the symphony and with a trio, sort of a miniature concerto style where the trio was featured within the context of the, of the orchestra. And it was uh, Brandon Temple and, on drums, Chris Marsh on bass and me on piano. And you know, Brandon Temple is an amazing drummer, has played with everyone, and he's a drummer. He sets the tempo, he sets the dynamics, he is the leader of, of the time-based portions of the music when he plays. Well, it turns out that Peter Bay is the conductor, is also accustomed to being the time-based leader of the music. And so there was a bit of a friendly tug of war. And then I'd written quite a few um, qu a pretty elaborate percussion parts and marimba parts. Uh, so those were, uh, but they, but those percussions were at the very back of the orchestra. And the music was fast enough and Brandon's playing is fast enough that you get that delay that far across the orchestra, there's a time delay. And so, we have the marimba playing this really fast, intricate part over there in the way in the corner. And the drummer, who's used to a thousand percent independence in the front, and Peter Bay in the middle trying to hold them all together through this piece. And it, it all came together and all worked out. But that, it was fun to watch that push and pull and, and Peter holding on to everybody. That's amazing. That's cool. <laughs> Behind the scenes. Yeah. Well, and we look forward to many, many more years of having you having many projects every year and, and working with us and can't wait to be able to engage with you again live. Um, it will happen soon and, and we're looking forward to it. But so appreciate um, you continuing to be such a sport of the Long Center, and we were thrilled to do the listening party for the album Grimm, so everybody should check out the album on Bandcamp, and you can download it there, and on our YouTube channel, you also can uh, check out the listening party, which was super fun, so thank you so much, Graham Reynolds. We really oh, appreciate you. you 
having you here in Austin and, and with the Long Center. Thank you, and thank you for everything you're doing with the Long Center. It's awesome. Oh, thanks, and thanks. thank you to our members for tuning in and for your continued support. Um, you know, we're here for artists, and we couldn't do it without your support. So thank you, and, and I hope everybody stays safe and healthy until we see you next.